Um, what a pleasure to follow all those brilliant speeches. Um, I've known Shay for a long time and her work with Glitch is absolutely incredible. In fact, um, she was an inspiration to me for my maiden speech in Parliament. Um, and I had to mention her because not only has she done all this work, but I've also seen the kind of abuse that she gets online as a friend and as well as my colleagues, and it's revolting, frankly, and it's still out there, but she hasn't sort of hidden away from that. I've seen that she takes breaks every now and again, but she does keep going. And, and that I think encourages and helps other people because if we just disappear from those online platforms, you know, then those bullies and online trolls have, have kind of won in a sense. So online abuse is kind of unfortunately part of our everyday life. We have to use those platforms if we're politicians and MPs. I've been involved with 5050 Parliament since it began mm -hmm. and I've been an ambassador for that. And this is the first year that I considered not taking part in some of their Ask Her to Stand events because I've been questioning, do I really want to encourage young people, young women to enter this public arena? And, you know, I've been a champion of that for many years now. And it was really sad that I had to sort of start asking myself that question. Um, but the abuse that not only I've had in the last year or so, but my colleagues have had, has just been sort of off the scale. Um, others have mentioned that, you know, due to the coronavirus, we've all been stuck at home looking at our computers and it's got worse. I think a lot of our feelings and our complicated sort of stresses and personal circumstances have probably led to us being more hostile to others, more stressed. We've got no outlet. We need to look at our mental health. And therefore, perhaps we are taking it out on strangers. But some of the things that I've had to read about myself, because, you know, pla platforms like Twitter and Facebook are unregulated, have been libelous. You know, I've been told by many lawyers this year who've approached me even about things I haven't seen written about myself, that I have got strong court cases, that I could easily win um, legal battles because some of the things that have been written about me are just absolute fiction. Most of the time I choose not to engage, I choose not to read them. Um, but when some things are sort of put in front of you and there are lies about your own family or your own background and they're written as fact for everyone to see and then they're shared by sort of opposition people, um, not, not opposition politicians, but people that sort of don't like my views on certain things and they're shared as facts, you do start to think, well, should I go down that legal route? And the reason I haven't is because the energy and, you know, effort it would take, apart from the money, would just divert me from the job I've got to do. And I'm too busy, frankly, to sort of worry about, you know, what, what people in my constituency might read and think isn't true I just hope that they know me better or they can approach me and ask me if it's true if they want to know but but when it when it does start to, I mean Siobhan's had some horrendous stuff and just worth saying that um, we do work on a cross-party basis and I know that the Labour women that I, I'm chair of most you know most of the Labour women saw what happened to Siobhan and nobody wasn't shocked and upset so we do work together and particularly in Parliament we're women first and we're party political second because we've learned that that is what we have to be we have to stick together we have to be sort of sisters really in parliament because even in my first week I was approached by a male colleague who said how's the, ab the abuse going online and I said oh I haven't really had any of that and he said you will and he sat me down and he said it's so much worse for women, women. and he sort of explained more about you know people like Diane Abbott and what she'd had to go through. And I hadn't really been that engaged with all of that. And it's true and it's awful. And he was right. Diane Abbott's abuse, I mean, we all know the figures now that she received more than half of the sort of racist and horrible online abuse was, you know, in one year was directed at this one particular woman. And she's a trailblazer for many young women and black people in parliament. And the fact that that's been turned into abuse is absolutely disgusting considering what she's achieved. You may not agree with her politics, but to, you know, that isn't the clever way to do it. You know, to sort of start calling her names and being racist is not a way to sort of disagree with her politics. The same with Siobhan, you know, the people on the far left, we've talked about the far right, but the people on the far left who will use the fact that she's pregnant or, you know, just people who are misogynists that will use the fact that she's pregnant and a woman, um, instead of making salient political points or arguments or disagreements, you know, are pathetic, frankly. And we don't want or need to hear that. They're not making any sort of valid or interesting points. And that's the problem with those platforms. They're not really there to have proper arguments with. When I've tried to engage people, 
you know, within a few seconds, it turns into sort of name calling and assumptions and people don't read what you're saying, you know, that they don't actually listen to what you're saying online. They just make assumptions, look at who you might follow. I mean, I followed Donald Trump. It doesn't mean I agree with anything the man had to say. You know, I'm interested in following all kinds of people, but I regularly get policed for who I follow on Twitter and Facebook, and it means absolutely nothing at all. So I think what we've got to do is this long awaited online harms bill. Um, I definitely agreed with Siobhan's points in her bill. Um, it was a cross party bill. We seem to all agree that the anonymity needs to be tackled and it really needs looking at. Also, who publishes what? You know, who is liable for the publishing of content and blogs and things like that? Where does the buck stop? How are we going to regulate that? Where is the difference between Parliament regulating it and Ofcom? I think those are the things we need to look at from a sort of strategic point of view. So um, I've waffled on enough and thanks very much, Debbie, for giving me the platform.